I know that today's guest is really special to Penn because I think this is the first interview that I can recall, and maybe I'm, you know, corrupting my old memories, but uh, where Penn didn't try to cut like if sometimes if a guest tells like a vulnerable story or something a little bit heavy, he'll cut it with humor, which I think works really well. But he never did that with Sarah. He mm. just sort of like let let it stay in the room. And I really felt like it was a sign of respect. Like I just felt like there was like a special oh, respect from you to Sarah. I felt it today. That was really sweet. I think yeah. I might have done that with Domino as well. Yeah, yeah probably. probably. It's true. Yeah. So every other guest who's been on the show, <laughs> Penn has no respect for you. Yeah, basically. And you just need to know. Yeah. yeah. Come on this you show. You thought he was lovely. Disrespected. You thought, wow, he's really great for a celebrity. Mm. No. <laughs> for, for a celebrity. celebrity. <laughs> Not for a human, but for a celebrity. <laughs> we, do, we do get into that a little bit. Uh, today's guest is, I think, a special treat for our listeners. Um, Sarah Gamble. She is a prolific writer in television. She was first a showrunner on Supernatural. A series, a, a huge, huge cult hit back mm -hmm. in the day. She came on, she wrote up th through the seasons, and then by season five was a showrunner then. She's also known for uh, co-creating and showrunning The Magicians, which was on sci-fi. And and I, I think at this point most famously was for my show, You. Or her show, mm -hmm. Yeah. Her sh yes, I can finally say something other than to clarify the name, my show. I can say her show. <laughs> her show, You, about... Me, written by her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this was, this was uh, for people who don't know, Sarah is bidding Joe adieu. She's, she's, she's leaving the show. At, at after point, as showrunners uh, sometimes do. Um, we do have one more season for you. Don't, don't worry, don't calm down. Uh, but season five will be helmed by some of our other writers. So, so this, this, was, this was a poignant farewell both to, to, to Sarah as the, as, as, the, as the formal head of the show, but then also a bit to the show itself. Because soon, we're going to be done, guys. <laughs> we're going to be done. You know, we can lay Joe to rest. But we had some real poignant conversation around, around that and other things. Uh, I, think you'll, I think you'll really enjoy it. So please, get on down. Listen in. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we could have been your middle school besties. Stealing our cousin's Playboy magazines to make paper mache. Oh, that's just so sweet. You took it to a place I was not expecting. Sarah, first of all, as we speak now, this is the, f this is, this is the first time since we would have met that you're no longer my boss, technically. Which is very poignant, right? Um, right? Yeah. You're like, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm like, pretty sure I'm still, still your boss. Your boss. <laughs> well, I <laughs> think we're, we're both producers of yes, that show that's now. that's true. But, but I'm I mean, not your showrunner show, anymore. Yeah, yeah, as a showrunner. I mean, like you're still co-creator. Anything you can really get back at me now. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be the next, his next, next murder victim is going to be named Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. No. <laughs> um, I, I kind of want to start right off with a few questions that maybe they're obvious, but I've I've been thinking about. Okay. Um. Is Nadia the closest character in our show that you've ever written to yourself? I actually never slept with a professor in college. Okay. <laughs> wow. Not for lack of trying. <laughs> <laughs> I did flirt with a lot, but he had very recently married a former student, so I was just oh. a little too late for that. Um, when she goes off about how most people have to be entertaining. That's what I was thinking. That, yeah, you've heard me. Yeah, that's, on that's that you, box. right? Yeah, yeah. but. Beck is a lot like me, or a lot like I was when I was her age, right. and in certain ways, love is. I think love is probably the furthest distance I had to travel in a female character. Mm. Right. Ellie is like a cooler version. Sure, mm. yeah. you know, at a so. different age, I suppose, just like every phase. The person I'm a lot like is Joe. Right. <laughs> yeah, that makes Minus sense. the murder, yeah, no, I the think judgment actually, in my head, right, right, right. I really monetize that with this Joe. So <laughs> that is, that's actually my next question. Mm -hmm. I just want to spend a moment, because you're Joe's thoughts, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to, I just wanted us all to appreciate for a moment, like, mm -hmm. just hats off. For, How yeah, screwed for, up that is. For, <laughs> no, it's it off. is, no, it's yes, 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 yes. I mean, yes, you're turning it into, yes, you have to subvert it, you have to do yeah. all that crazy stuff. But just... Just appreciating for a moment, like the like the Joe's thoughts. <laughs> I mean, they're they've become a thing. They've become a thing. There, it's like it's yeah. now it's now kind of inseparable from m me and my vibe in the world. Um, like so many memes, you know, 
so I guess like how do you feel now? You're 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 passing Joe's thoughts off to people that you know very well and trust. Yes. But how does it feel now to be sort of on the other side of having done this? Um well, I should start by saying they've been writing Joe's thoughts with me the whole time. Mm. It really writing television is not usually a solo sport. Right. As right. you know, and I wrote the pilot with Greg Berlanti who was the one who said we should call the voiceover Joe's thoughts because it's a separate character. Mm. This is a technical thing, but, mm. you know, usually you read a script, and if you're hearing voiceover, it just says the name of the character and then V.O. V. Yeah. Mm. But he was like, it's not Joe V.O. It's Joe's thoughts, and Joe's thoughts are going to mostly be the opposite of what he's saying. It's mm-hmm. almost like the other half of him. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, you know, Caroline invented it, and then Greg and I worked with it in the pilot, and then when you're running a writer's room, it's like all of those people's job is to try to sound like you Mm. on the page, sound like the showrunner sounds. So it was a, you know, as it evolved, and I'm sure you felt it become more confident as season one rolled on, right? You're like, you're feeling every adjustment as we make it, right? And I feel like the first half of season one, there was was a lot of, um, well, maybe season one in general, we were just finding the line. Are there any thoughts that, kind of hit you the hardest because for me Mm. i get them all on his scripts i'm not creating them so sometimes when i'm doing the voiceover i'm surprised which ones hit me i'm surprised like oh my god whoa that one kind of made me more emotional than i thought or like that one was like that one was harder to say than i thought it would be or you know what have you do you is there any is there ever is there any thought that hit you the hardest or that you remember the feeling you're talking about of uh something is uncomfortable or feels weirdly vulnerable, Mm. that's kind of the feeling I'm looking for when I'm writing a lot of the time. It's like a really, it's a good sign if you feel bad when Mm. you're writing a script. I feel you. Because you're getting at something a little scary or a little dangerous or a little controversial, and that's what you, you don't want to do the thing people expect you to do. Mm. So I follow that a lot. I mean, Joe's thoughts work because he's being mostly honest with us right it's at least it's very i think this is part of why the show works is the the seduction of like only we watching the show know what he's really thinking so like he's our friend not the person in the scene Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course he's also lying to himself so that only works so much but um you know in order to pull that off it's like what you have to do is write dialogue that makes the character kind of um that doesn't flatter him yeah you know it's like our, our our pure not pure, you know, yeah, our pure thoughts, our uncensored thoughts, they're horrible. All of us think horrible stuff all the time. At least everyone I've ever talked to. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cynicism, yeah. the sort of the, yeah. the animal part of us that is yeah. just like sort of reading the world for danger, I feel like, is what that is. And wants to be better mm-hmm. than yeah. other people, which is a huge thing for Joe. Yeah. yeah. Um, any chance he gets to look at someone and decide that he's better he goes for it. And I I don't walk through the world thinking that way all the time, but I know what that feels like. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what question I'm answering anymore. You want to no, read that, the question? No, 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 no. No, no, I mean, look, trust me. That's, that's how this yeah. whole podcast is going to happen, Sarah. <laughs> I think that is, I mean, to me, um, that I think about in, in terms of trauma, like, you mm-hmm. know, and not to go off on a whole trauma spiral, but that is the, you know, it's what makes us see relationships as competition, which is the whole trope that I feel like our show is dissecting. So, I mean, you know, also I do feel like indebted to Joe specifically for having to think about this now so much and having yeah. to sort of work it out. I think, I don't know, but I think it's actually improved the way I view relationships. <laughs> I've know? learned a lot because I've had to put it into words. And when you're writing it, it's like we spend all day in a writer's room, so... I, it, it's sort of a process of me learning how to say things in sentences that are sort of nascent little instincts and impulses. Mm. So I really have mm. had to kind of state very plainly what our philosophy is on relationships for the show, which isn't terribly different than my philosophy in Lightweight. Before we segue to this, though, I have to say I remember being in post on the pilot with Greg. Mm-hmm. And um, it was the first time we heard your voiceover. And that when we sat down, we were like, well, 
this is going to make or break the show. I hope the voiceover works. Mm-hmm. And this might be a journey. I mean, we've all seen stuff where the voiceover feels forced or totally, yeah. just is totally weird or sort of cheesy. Mm. And voiceover has a pretty mid reputation, you know, it's, anyway. Yeah, it's kind of, it can be yeah. a bit sketchy, yeah. Um, you nailed it immediately. I don't know if you were thinking something in particular the first time you sat down to do it, but I, and I wasn't expecting it. It's like, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, he is like leaning in and he is sort of almost saying it in my ear. Like right. there was a, mm-hmm. um, something that then our sound team really went with in terms of like, they mix your voice so that it feels more intimate than yeah. any of the other sounds we're hearing. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's and, so I know, cool. and, I, and I mean, that is how I, I have to do it. So, um, I mean, it's quiet. It it's is. really, really, it's really, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, the way they have to mix and master it and everything, it's like I get so close to the mic and I have to, I mean, the, usually the mic is so hot that if I am have, like, change in my pocket or if they're, mm-hmm. if I'm wearing something that has, like, any, like, buttons on it and mm-hmm. I move in a certain way, like, you can hear it. That's how hot the mic is and how mm-hmm. much I kind of, like, um, yeah, it's a very, very specific process. I've never seen you wear a button. Just, <laughs> just that out. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, shirt and buttons. No, 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 yeah. like, uh, no, no, like no, I've never button. seen you wear a shirt with buttons. Yeah. Right. Oh, I <laughs> Actually, uh, little, the reason I don't in real life that much, except for like linen shirts, yeah. is because of Dan Humphrey. I will just say another Because he wore button downs? Because I wore oh. almost exclusively <laughs> button downs. As, as he Dan. took that from you. And I just yeah. feel like, yeah. I and literally... Joe has taken hats from you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you I need them. I know, but the I world on no, the subway. But I, now I look more like Joe <laughs> when I true. have a hat no. on. You just got to wear a visor now. No, you know what I found <laughs> works, The horrible guys? thing of becoming so much more famous for playing somebody who's trying to hide. You know what's funny? I actually have figured out and uh, uh, my oldest mentioned this to me. He's 14 now and really thinking for himself, has some great ideas. <laughs> he, uh, We went to a basketball game. He's like, wear a backwards hat. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Joe would it never. It worked Joe would never. so well. He would never. <laughs> Yeah. And what's funny is that my face is on full display, but it's just like, yeah. is that nerd? Couldn't be that yeah. guy. I can't see your hair. Your hair <laughs> we is have to cut this because now people are going to know. They're going to be looking for the backwards I mean, hat. To, be fair, to be fair, I was wearing a mask too, but I get recognized in a mask a lot. So the backwards yeah. hat did, really did something. Yeah. It did something. Just before we get too far off the thought, Joe's thoughts, I wanted to yeah. ask you, Sarah, because you just said that it's like, it is some of your own impulses. It is like channeling into sort of those dark thoughts that we all have. Is there a Joe's thought that surprised you the most when you, like, even surprised yourself when you wrote it? Is there one that stands out? Um, I mean, that's such a great question. I don't really have the Rolodex in mm-hmm. front of me. Um, I feel, you know, one thing that surprised me, uh, and I can't take credit for it. Again, it's like everything is a big mush, and probably I saw it for the first time because somebody handed me a draft. But um, I, when we pitched it, we said, you know, he's a perfect boyfriend. And mm. that's all he wants is to be the perfect boyfriend. And and he really does check a lot of boxes. He's very romantic. Mm. He's like, I actually think I said he's great in bed. And it's like, but but Joe. Not at first. Well, Joe on the show frequently has problems in bed. Mm. <laughs> and that was an area that I didn't know we were going to get into. And, uh, you know, so that but surprised that's me. That's what I brought it's, to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is like a level of vulnerability that kind of like you can feel the temperature change a little bit when it's about that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, like when somebody pitches something and, and I feel everybody tense, I'm like, mm-hmm. let's stay here for a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's all be tense. Let's not move on yet. So, you know, running a writer's room is the process of like subtly torturing people and then like ventilating it. And we yeah. can all just talk about what we, you know, mm-hmm. we watch this dude eat a really hot corn chip on YouTube. <laughs> 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 you know, and then <laughs> turn it up again. You know, yeah. Penn and I recently pitched a project to someone who used to work at and he said that you, you and Greg pitched you to in a bunch of other places, and it freaked his boss out so much that he didn't like take the project that seriously because you guys had like done research on him uh-huh. on social media. And can you share that? Because it was really That's the way he was telling us it was a really interesting story. But he was basically like, my boss got so freaked out he like didn't even want to look at the concept. Like that's why they didn't go for it. I'm so sorry. No, no. We pitched it wrong, so it wasn't on you. <laughs> but Netflix turned out to be the perfect. I, think we're all right. I actually think I you think pitched we're all it perfectly. Right, yeah. um, and it, like freaked this guy out so much. Yeah. Well, it was it was memorable. I mean that 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 he admitted to you that it freaked him out. Because everyone's just like, it was great when they talked mm. to me, but I'm like, I'm sure there are places I'll never work again. Yeah. <laughs> um it was again, it was Greg Berlanti's idea for anybody who doesn't know who he is, you actually do. You have seen mm. many of his shows. He, he, he's Most prolific for... television producer ever. 
uh, in right? history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the whole DC universe that was on the wow. CW for a long time, and um, the flight attendant, and our show, and a lot of a lot of shows. Uh, and uh, he was like, "Let you know, the thing that was different and special about this concept was that he wasn't Mister Robot. Mm-hmm. He wasn't like a super hacker. Usually, that guy is like." He's an everyday workaday guy, and he's better at computers than anyone you've ever met in your life. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's what terrifies women when they walk down the street. Like, I'm not scared I'm going to accidentally run into a, a genius. Yeah. I'm scared because it doesn't actually take a genius to destroy a woman's life. Mm-hmm. And all it takes is a determined guy with, like, maybe seven ninety nine mm-hmm. to pay to get your driver's license information. So wow. to prove it, we, we stalked one person in each room. We did make sure it wasn't the highest, you know, it was the VP, but um, based on their Facebook at the time, whatever they put on social media and whatever we could garner specifically from like following to their closest friends, because oftentimes you're in other people, you're tagged in Mm -hmm. other people's photos. And so we were able to be like, so you get your hair blown out in Encino. Wow. And this is the name of your son's soccer team. <gasps> Oof, yeah, that, yeah. that one that one be that, like, yeah. Oh. yeah. And Oof. it proved the point though yeah. that like all of us should just hide in a cave until we die because it's a very <laughs> dangerous place out there and you don't know. But mm. yeah. yeah. That's also I think a really, you know, for the legacy of this show, whatever it ends up being, it wouldn't it wouldn't have been the same if he was talalented at that. I mean, I think of him as he has above average intelligence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite things about him is that he's so well read and that he's genuinely self taught. Mm-hmm. He really, that part is kind of like also something I, I feel like it's almost heroic yeah. about him. I love that part of him. That's the yeah. part that I, you know, for all the things I say and impress about him, I can't think that way when I'm shooting. So, like, that's the part no. of him that I love. That's, the, that's mm-hmm. the part of him that I connect to, like, entirely. Yeah. Yeah. But also, he liked typewriters in season one he was collecting vintage stuff right, yeah. and so no he couldn't also be like let me hack the algorithm or whatever it is people say mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i'm clearly not that writer <laughs> <laughs> there's a little note that i wanted to give you that i have heard some feedback from friends and, and journalists alike um who all in this case are happen to be black women who have said that um they feel like an unusual safety in that no black female characters mm. die. Mm-hmm. Um, so first, the props, that's a lovely thing. That's a lovely statistical little nice thing to have. Mm-hmm. Um, when you are thinking about who dies, who doesn't, yeah. I mean, how, like, I don't, you know, this is kind of a broad question that you'll know how to ask and answer better than I can because you know how you do it. But, like, mm-hmm. who, you know, do you start out being, like, who, you know what I mean? Like, do you start out... Knowing who's there, knowing who should die, who shouldn't. I mean, wh- how, do, how, when you're mapping out a season, what is that even, how does that start? What we didn't ever want to do was, like, I remember even growing up and hearing this narrative sometimes about films where it's like, well, they're kind of, like, really lingering on her dead body. Mm. And it's naked. And yeah. they're, you know, and it's sort of sexualizing mm. a dead girl. And there's a long history in cinema of sexualizing and fetishizing and romanticizing women as they're being abused and murdered. Mm -hmm. And we lose credibility as soon as we do that. Like, we're we're in this, like, razor-thin little lane of credibility where we're saying we're going to be irreverent about the fact that he's a stalker and a murderer and he violates women in every single episode, but we're not being glib about violence against women. That's Mm -hmm. where we started, right? So the stuff that people have noticed since then all of those things are just part of the conversation that we're having in the room and also that we're having with the actors that we cast, people like Tati, Mm -hmm. where it's like, first it was, you know, in season one, it was Beck, this, you know, gorgeous blonde yoga teacher just trying to make her way in New York. And as, you know, the story continues with characters like Delilah and Marianne, and so, in other words, women of color, Mm -hmm. it's like part of that conversation is, well, Beck's expectation of safety walking down the street is different than mm-hmm. Marianne's expectation of safety. Love's expectation of safety is different. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's certain things that Marianne just, like, wouldn't put herself in that. So those conversations just start there with kind of, like, mm-hmm. the facts of the case about what it's like to be a girl mm-hmm. <laughs> in the world. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, I heard um, Tati, I like a snippet on TikTok of, of Tati Gabrielle in an interview, I think, on Jennifer Hudson's show, and she was saying that it was really important for her in this season to make sure that the character of Marianne 
had an awareness of yeah. what was going on because she felt like as a black woman, as black people, there's just a constant awareness of your surroundings and of like your safety and who you're safe with, who you're not. And that, that it would it was important for her for the character to have that too. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, we've we've had a dialogue about it since not even since she was cast. I was talking about her during talking about it with her during the casting process. Mm -hmm. And I sort of in cases like that, I'm kind of following the actor's lead because it's yeah. like, you know, I'm not hiring you so you can have some big conversation with me about, um, you know, how the show's going to be received. Like, your actual job is to show up and know your lines and yeah, right. mm -hmm. do a great job. But if you want to engage on this or if it's important to you to engage on this, I will because it's important to us in the writer's room to just, you know, I, I never imagine that I'm going to have, like, a show that perfectly, you know, uh, uh, doesn't step into any problematic like writing is problematic you you you, you something is always going to be problematic for someone mm. so our sort of standard for ourselves making this show is just be conscious be conscious have the conversation don't ever shortcut when there's something that the writer's room is just um you know feeling a little bit like they just want to talk about it as people mm. then we just stop and we talk about it as people mm. And then Joe's dancing in his underwear with the chef's hat on. And <laughs> you know. then right. we make this That's crazy, right. yes, yeah. on the other end of this <laughs> yeah. thoughtful process is this insane show. Were you guys ever considering anyone else for the role of Joe? You don't have to say who, but that's one part of the question. I want to know names. And the other is, why Penn? Why were you guys so interested in Penn? <laughs> we, were, we were auditioning actors, and we also, you know, when, when you're casting what we call number one on the call sheet, there's a simultaneous thing that's happening often where you're auditioning actors, and those are basically actors who are in a place in their career where they still audition. Like, mm -hmm. Penn is not, with the exception of certain directors who anyone would audition for, I think. Course, yeah. He's he's at a place, and he was then, at a place in his career where what you do with an actor like Penn, who's already been a star in television, is you meet with them. You just, like, have coffee and you talk. And then the conversation might organically move on to the script and we might start reading it together, but it kind of depends on that chemistry so you know he's he's at a place where he's earned that he's that established but at the same time we're we're reading 17 people a day and we're talking to agents about like is this person who started another show are they interested and they'd like mm -hmm. to talk and but mm -hmm. as soon as Penn's name was brought up we were all like wait does he want to do it because he'd be he'd be too perfect mm -hmm. and it's because I mean I hadn't I mean, I've seen I've seen you in a couple of movies, and I, I saw maybe the first season or so of Gossip Girl, and I just was like, but I just don't think that guy would kill anyone, yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm. And if he's a creeper, mm. we're kind of yeah. done. Like, we don't need to make a show about a guy who fails to hide that he's a creeper. We need to mm. make a show about a guy who fools everybody. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you were in the mix, we were done talking about anyone else. Just really? FYI, I'm really, really glad it worked out, because otherwise... Yeah, <laughs> I have to start over. That's yeah. been, you know, that's been kind of a little bit of my fear this entire time. Is like, is the fact that he's so likable just mean that I'm not doing a good enough job playing a murderer? <laughs> like, no. is that, you know, I is mean, that, that's that. Uh, you know, it'll as an actor when yeah. you watch yourself. By the way, there's oh, I, you're plenty terrifying. I just think, yeah. you know, just, thank you. You're not that right. likable. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> you're both. Yeah. <laughs> But it's definitely always there, the monkey. Mm. Is it a weird thing? It's like, I don't think it's something you control. I think some actors, and I mean, we all have, I think, a slightly fraught relationship to the word likable. I don't know if you sure. do, but I do, yeah. certainly. Well, I think actually, you know, something we've touched on here, and I think what we've talked about a lot is like yeah. that likability for women is a totally different, like, yeah. I don't know, marker or something yeah. than it is for a man. But it's like, I don't know that it's something you're doing. It's sort of you, what your energy is and what the camera sees when we sure, point it yeah. at you that like, I think of actors like Brian Cranston is like that. And so they made a show where he was progressively more horrible for five seasons in Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. But we were so on board. We really, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's, it's like a strange superpower, I think. Tom Hanks, I guess, would be the Mount Rushmore of likability, right. right? Has he done it? Has he played? Oh, he did play um, the manager. Elvis's manager. Elvis, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but mostly, like a, you know, he could be doing horrible things and we'd just be like, yeah. Yeah. I hope he gets out of this jam. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have a feeling a from the inside? Is it a thing or is it just like, whatever, my hair is curly, people like me? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I... Uh, uh, and the little gap in the it's teeth. It's the nose. I think it's, it's also yeah. the little it's gap the, in the, the gap teeth. In the oh, they've been thinking about it. Actually, yeah. actually, I do think the gap, I do think the gap does a lot. The gap makes me look younger and mm. I think it does something there. Um... 
Well, uh, I don't know as it pertains to this show, but I just know that probably as an actor, your relationship to your uh, image or... or Mm -hmm. (sighs) Yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure. My brain goes in so many places, which just means it's like, it's not something I have enough perspective on, Mm. you know? Mm. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. It does. It's just, it's just, just it's strange. It's a strange thing. I don't think who, I don't think any actor can, can, can truly mask who they are. I mean, I think even like, you know, what, Mm -hmm. what I personally feel like I see even the actors who are sort of like renowned for transforming. I feel like I'm still seeing very much them. Mm -hmm. It's just the way in which they are is kind of intense. And so everything seems transformative when you're seeing somebody like dissociatively angry, you know, so I don't know. I, I I have my own kind of take on all that, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think you can actually mask who you are that much, mm-hmm. that much. No, um, unless you are somehow like really one of those special sociopaths. In which I case, will say yeah. this. I don't mean to embarrass you. I'll be very quick about it. But there are plenty. I'm going to shock you guys and tell you, there are plenty of actors, well-known actors working in Hollywood who seem incredibly likable and are. Uh, really, we're just going to say really challenging Mm -hmm. in real life. Like what the camera sees in love and what we love as their fans does not translate into Mm -hmm. day-to-day interaction with them. And they're not great people. And Mm so um, you are the, you are really as advertised, (laughs) you know, you really, really are. And it's funny because like I, you know, I've had the experience of of being on shows uh, where, you know, you're basically casting people who have never had their name on a chair, on the back of a chair before. They're very new to it, very young. And and I've also worked just with a couple of established actors like you. And you really don't know. Like, you're walking in mm-hmm. like, well, I hope it's okay. Like, I hope it's going to be okay. And um, I, t- I say this to him all the time. And he gives me just exactly this look, which mm. is not much. <laughs> like, you are the <laughs> best <laughs> number one I have ever worked with in Aww. my career. Thank you. You are Aww, the standard. Sweet. And... Um, I hope it happens for me again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't pay for how great this has been for the last few seasons Aww. with the next one. But, like, no one will ever get away with it with me again because I'm like, but Penn mm. manages to be a great guy <laughs> while he's in every single scene. So, no, thank you. So thank you. I don't know, I don't know how you do it. I but. think... Well, That's as so you said, sweet, I do, yeah, I mean, I do appreciate that, but Dawn I do think, prayers. I do think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably actually it. Yeah. I do think that people in my position, um, I do, I mean, I do think, I do think, like, we get a lot of credit for, for not being bad, like, and yeah. I mean, you know, and I do, I do think I put a lot of energy into trying to be like kind and, and gracious on set, especially because it's like, as y- you know, the person who's the number one on the call sheet does set the tone, whether they want to or not. You know? Correct. Yeah. So I do, I do, I do think about that, but, but I do think we also get a lot of credit for just not being sort of predictably unkind. Right. <laughs> or, mo- or monstrous. <laughs> yeah. I know it is, it is a weirdly low bar, almost probably insultingly low, uh, yeah, that's but kind of what you, I mean, you know, but, it's, there was a, but it exists for a reason. I mean, I think yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it will make, you know, as a showrunner, it will overtake your existence. Wow. If you yeah, have it's just, an it's, actor who won't like leave their track, you know, uh, I just, I just, yeah. yeah. I, I also personally feel like while I can understand it, cause I've been on the other side of the line and I see kind of how the cultural, the culture of the way people will treat, people in my position is such that it's like it's a self-perpetuating it can create that yeah. so like i get it i've seen people like who are kind of unwillingly treated that way and then they kind of become that way because mm-hmm. it's like ah! you know yeah um but whatever i still don't really have a lot of patience for it and i don't like to be around it and it makes me yeah so and did, I, did I, I, honest, at the moment i knew the moment i knew how this tell was, us like I, I i was like maybe you can relax and stop being so superstitious and just um accept that this might be a good experience <laughs> that's what mm. i was saying man season one somebody called me and said like just say probably our line producer was like um yeah pen was late to set he hadn't come out of his trailer yesterday and i was like what happened i was like oh this is the moment and it's only <laughs> season one and the penny has dropped right and he was like yeah he was meditating and he no. lost track of time <laughs> see the and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I guess I did something okay in a past life. Right. Meditating or doing cocaine? Yeah. Can you just <laughs> confirm? It Whatever it was. Difference? <laughs> yeah, hot tip for yeah. up-and-coming actors. Uh, Call it meditating. Uh, I don't recall that, but I guess it's there. Sarah, uh, there has been a lot of public discourse around Penn setting a boundary in mm-hmm. the latest season. Oh, yes, the famous boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, oh, I want to know for you as a showrunner, what was it like to have that conversation with Penn? 
And I want to set the disclaimer just so you know, I've, I don't know if you heard, but I, I, I've been clear about how, you know, receptive oh, the, the, and gracious you are. All the coverage has been 100% in Sarah's corner and then 50% in Penn's, 50% yeah, right. against Penn. <laughs> Everyone in your corner. I really, so anyway, uh, go, go, I mean, go, I admire ahead. the way you've been handling that conversation. Like, predictably, when the word sex appears in the title yeah, of something, just, it will. Yeah, and really... I do think that the discourse has gone far beyond anything that you were talking about. Yeah, yes. it has. Yeah. Totally. And about what we were talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, yeah. it was sort of initially a private conversation. And... You know, it's become public now, so it is what it is. But it'd be interesting to hear you. Know, yeah. Hear you. One fun thing is we were an hour at least into the phone call when oh, you brought it up, more. right? Because Pro- I pitched I mean, you, you the whole season. Yeah, and, and in fact, like, I, mm. I waited to... I w- it was something that I knew that I wanted to ask, as I've said, and I'll clarify here again, yeah. before we met, this was something that I even wanted to set in my own career, didn't understand if it was possible, you know, yeah. th- th- who knows what the future holds. It was just like, you know my orientation and therefore something I thought about. So by the time this pitch for season four comes along, it seemed like I was like, actually Joe's kinda Joe's kinda headed in this direction, maybe. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna go ahead and 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 see and see. So anyway. He definitely wasn't like in a marriage and cheating on his wife and having foursomes with her. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good time to say we can yeah. reduce. Yeah. Um it was not a it was not a very difficult conversation for me. No, it, honestly. Yeah. Like, first of all, nobody was saying I refuse to do something. Mm-hmm. We were both just saying, like, what are we gonna like? I was my job in that conversation was just to like pinpoint exactly what you were asking for mm-hmm. and what was making you uncomfortable. And like, there's a big difference, for example, between saying I have a problem with the content of the show you're writing, and I am having this issue around my own performance, like what my job is demanding that I do, specifically with my body. And I just don't think that's a very complicated conversation Mm -hmm. for us to have because I'm not, we're not in the business of saying strip down and touch someone if, you know, that's not what you want to do. Yeah, that actually brings up how it's also not a common, it's like there's one thing, one thing I've said too is like when people bring up the, well, what about murder? It's like, guys, I'm not murdering anybody. (laughs) <laughs> At the end of the day, there's something that you can't simulate, which is physical touch. It's just it just comes yeah. down to that. It's like it's a, not everybody has to do this in their job. It just is. It's like you know, there's a lot of. I caught up on the negative feedback way after the fact, and mm-hmm. then I was like, oh, okay. But people love to state so clearly as though they've experienced this. Like, mm. why don't you just do your job? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it's I like, mean, everybody's. You know, we're not all the same. There's stuff I won't write. So sure, I don't take yeah. those jobs, or I'm not right for the, you know. And there are things, you know, for example, if you were like. But a little like right wing propaganda, like mm-hmm. we'll pay you really, really well, right? I don't know. I can't. It's like I have blinds, but yeah. I don't. Right. But um, it it doesn't matter what the actor next to you is comfortable with. They may feel a completely different way about right, what kissing. Yeah. They may think it's not the same, which is fine because that's their, you know. But you, the two people in that conversation are me and you. We're making the show together. We were many years into it at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, let me understand. My job is just let me understand the parameters and then come back with a plan. Mm -hmm. It becomes surprisingly quickly, it becomes very technical, right? Yeah. I was the worst, the nightmare version of a conversation like that is, I just think it's bad that we murder people. (laughs) Or (laughs) like, I don't think, I don't want, I don't want this character to be in sexual situations. but But you started by saying like, I do understand the show we're making. And, you know, let's not speak in absolutes, but also I understand like the story we're telling, I'm not asking for a different story. I'm just saying this with my body. And it's like, well, it's your body. Mm -hmm. So, and since time immemorial, and it's like, it's called cinema, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because we do magic, it's all smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back, like the first conversation was about all this stuff we didn't even really end up needing to do, which is like body doubles, VFX, Mm. using certain angles, certain camera lenses, just, I was like, listen, so we have this arsenal of things we can do if we need to. Mm -hmm. And how about we just like look at the scenes and talk about them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It, you know, I I will say that, so I've been doing, I haven't been doing this as long as you have, but almost, right? I've been working in television for almost 20 years. And the industry has changed a lot. In that time, I was frequently the only woman in the room when I started and um, the only woman on set. And, uh, you know, when intimacy coordinators became a thing, I was very relieved Mm -hmm. because I had been sort of an amateur intimacy coordinator for a couple Mm -hmm. of years. There were times when I would fly to a set in Vancouver because I felt like I should be there that day Mm. because something very intimate 
was going to happen and I just wanted to be present. But it is also a weird feeling to be the boss and to be it's not quite right. So I was relieved that we were making these strides and having this conversation at all Mm. because I don't think I mean, I'm certainly not in this business to make people feel bad and weird and uncomfortable. Like we're playing games and we're having fun. Mm -hmm. We're all doing what we love the most, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And nobody's feeling weird about people touching them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I'm glad. I'm also, I have to say, I think it's nice to have that converse, imperfect as it has been, it's nice to see that conversation happen where a man has been talking about this because Mm -hmm. I think people hear it a little bit differently when it's a woman saying that, and usually it that's is. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And so that's I appreciate true. that about yeah, you. Yeah, that's, that's you know? an interesting perspective on it, too. Yeah. The, the nature of the, the way that we had that conversation, it felt like it was just kind of, you know, if if it hadn't become a, a sort of a public, like, um, soundbite, I don't know that people would have noticed that much, you mm-hmm. know? And no, but it's but I do, I, I think, so I've had my qualms about whether or not it feels like, well, was that, like, but I do think it's it, – it, you're right. I think it's positive that at least some man has entered the conversation as well. And, and I don't necessarily see myself, like, in that role doing that thing all the time. But, it, yeah, it does yeah. seem like – it does seem like – Maybe just a necessary part of it. It's just like the same way that we're going to all have different comfort comfort levels with a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You have the comfort level you have with disclosing how you feel publicly and talking about it and having conversation about it, which is great. And like, but the the funny thing is people would be shocked to know all of the things that were faked or different or Mm -hmm. rewritten on the day or Mm -hmm. like one of the actors had the flu. So like nobody was kissing. And if uh, if we do our jobs right, if the director is clever on the day and then the editor and I are clever in post, then you won't be watching it going, why doesn't this story work? Mm -hmm. You'll be we'll have found some way to rewrite and reset the scene Mm -hmm. so that it gives you whatever feeling it needed to have. And that happens all the time with people who change their minds about taking their pants off Mm -hmm. in a scene or for whatever reason need to stay six feet for COVID kind of Mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Um, So, you know, where the rubber meets the road, it was not a very big deal for the Mm -hmm. season in terms of, um, you know, there were a couple of things come to think of, you know, where like we were sort of figuring it out a little bit in the writing, and there was, like, one scene we had to reshoot. Um, That's right, yeah. But, uh, you know. I feel like that wasn't yeah. even, that was that was more, That are you talking about the Kate yeah. scene in, from episode three, I think yeah. it is? That, I mean, in that. In the park? Yes, in the park. But it that, wasn't that, originally in yeah, the park. It wasn't originally in the park. No. Mm. See, I went too far. Clever. Yeah, I'll own it. Yeah. Like, I went too far, and it was, I think part of it was that I was like, how much can I just remove these things in the scene and so the fact that the two of you were, um, like, hate flirting a yeah. lot at that point, I was like, so there won't be any kissing. And maybe, and then for whatever reason, that she was taking him into this very sexual environment, this club. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it was just too far. Yeah, it, was it was too it, cold. Well, I think what it was yeah. is that that was discovering, like, where the heart of the show is or isn't. You yeah. know, it, it, was, it ended up being too hateful. Yeah. Right. Which on we the page, did, I have yeah. to say, worked. Like, on the page, somehow, it did make sense. And then something about the way we were bringing it to life, like, mm-hmm. it just somehow didn't track with what with everything else we're doing. Yeah, and also, I mean, Joe is... Joe is a fundamentally romantic yeah. character. Yeah. And even if thing, he's, he like, is. you know, banging someone he hates mm-hmm. for the moment because they haven't fallen in love yet, right? Yeah. Still, it has to be... This is what I learned, still learning in season four of the show, right? Like, oh, it has to be the romantic comedy version of this. We're not yeah. going to do the David Fincher version of that scene where it's cold and it's clinical and it's you know yeah. sexy we're gonna do the notting hill version i would say of, david fincher's even gone where it's not even sexy it's just it's it's very it's like disturbing it's sarah like, this is so vindicating because we said to Penn at some point we think that you is basically a rom-com but yeah. also and yeah. he was like rom-com i've never thought of it as a rom-com <laughs> it's both at the same time yeah. no yeah. It's, yeah i i mean i yeah. knew what you were saying but i think yeah. the way you said it i was trying to catch you in the i think you were saying yeah, it so, yeah, and yeah. i was like it's it's not a road go. <laughs> I know. I really, I really did love Joe until episode eight. Yeah. Now I'm. <laughs> uh oh. Sarah, I, I want to ask a couple questions about love because she's so iconic. Yeah. So I want to know one like, 
I think Victoria has said that she knew from the beginning that she was going to get killed, like that it was a two season arc. Yeah. Given how much people became obsessed with her and how good she was, did you guys ever think about not killing her? And did were you nervous when you did kill her, like how people would react? Uh, no. I mean, that means we've done our job, and she's done her job. I mean, mm. Victoria is very special, mm. and I think a lot of why people react the way they do is about like just who Victoria is as an actor, and then also the chemistry between the two of you when you're working. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's just true in the business now is like, we used to live in a world where we made 55,000 episodes a season, right? <laughs> 22. <laughs> and all actors would sign these contracts for many years to be on a show. And now the world looks different and streaming shorter orders, shorter seasons. And you can cast frequently, you can cast a more, you know, a, a, an actor that you like really want to cast. If you don't say but I'm going to need you to sign a contract for the next eight years of your life or yeah. something. And so when we made the deal with her, it was a two season deal. Like we, mm-hmm. when we met her, it's like, this is what the, this is what the commitment would be to do this. So I, I um, have always just sort of, we were all always just thinking of it in that box. And also like, this is what the show is. The show is like, yeah. he doesn't, you don't, you don't get to have nice things mm-hmm. on the show. Like, because yeah. Joe messes up all the nice things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So eventually she got to go. Everybody he loves got to go. You say that like a parent. I just like, and the viewer is a toddler. Yeah. You're like, I'm gonna have to take yeah. that. Now. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna. Yeah. Is that but. your toy? Yeah, I know that you like that toy. You know why I have to take it from you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was more just like, she is gonna crush that death scene. That's how I felt she about really it, did and too. she did. She did. Yeah, the like shaking mouth. Oh, yeah, it was the hardest. I was like, I really hope this works out because I'm asking for them to be like paralyzed and yeah. poisoned and talking yeah. and. Oh, no. You didn't yeah. just ask one of us to be paralyzed. You asked both of us yeah, to be paralyzed. Yeah. <laughs> so, good. so good. This could go a number of ways. You yeah. pulled it off. You should do this professionally. Well, you know, she had she had to do more, like, she had to go into paralysis and then speak as she died. I think that's much harder. I got to do nothing. I got to do, I got to, I, what's the line of nothing? How do I blink? How do I, how do I do a little bit more than nothing? Yeah. <laughs> it's a very funny, very funny day on set. Mm-hmm. Wow. Just a few rapid fire, like like these are kind of like the, the kind of things you see people comment on, yeah. you know. Okay. Um, season one, Mooney's Bookshop is next door to a real food spot. I think probably Asian of some kind called uh, called Nirvana. Mm-hmm. And season two, uh, his new bookshop is Anavran, which is Nirvana spelled backwards. I've always thought this was a complete accident. Yeah. Was it an accident or is it intentional? It was. If it was intentional, it was like unconsciously so. Yeah, right, right. I think we were. Um, wow, that's amazing. Isn't that like we were just inspired by Erwan. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Which yes. is a Los Angeles grocery store where smoothies cost five hundred dollars. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> insane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Kate's building number, shown quite prominently in many dramatic moments in episode four, <laughs> is sixty nine. Uh-huh. Were you having a laugh? Someone was, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. I saw it in the cut, and I was like, I, yeah. you know, because like, I, could, I could have been like, I had that moment. The VFX? So, because I could have changed it to 68, Yeah. but then I was like, I think it's, I think it's fine. Because it was I real, I think I'm right? overthinking this. Wasn't it real? I'm not sure if they changed the numbers or not. I think or it was just, real. I think okay. I, I think because I tried to answer this question uh-huh. myself once I noticed. I was like, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay, rapid fire. Um, did, uh, okay, this, did you ever try writing a, cameo for cardi b did you did you think about it do you like is there a way we can involve her i think we could uh, london didn't seem like the place to do it that's true actually yeah but yeah um i was like maybe once we're back in the states like there's a few amazing people who could cameo but yeah. it's sort of it's also like tonally it has to be right yeah you know i was gonna be a very like mm-hmm. an artiste about this. Yeah. yeah. But also like... No, of course. It has to, it has to make sense. But also, you wouldn't it just be cool it. if she just came in for the day and she played, I don't know, like the manager at the rival bookstore? It would be amazing. Yeah. That would People, be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Did you use Taylor Swift's anti-hero because of Penn's TikTok or was that already planned? Uh, it was in part inspired by that TikTok, actually. <laughs> I mean, Taylor Swift means a lot to the show, as yes. we know. And I have never had so many people talk about a song as... They did with Exile the season before. That's mm-hmm. right, yeah. And then um, I feel like I met you a little bit when I saw your TikTok. Because I don't <laughs> usually get that silly. Yeah, yeah. You're, you know, like, we don't, I don't usually yeah. ask you to do that stuff. And it's yeah. just like, oh. Yeah. There's like a parallel universe where we're making a show where you get to be like the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the time. Because yeah. you're so 
free and funny. Um, and then, yeah, that was in my head a little bit. And then we just needed the song. We needed a big song there. And it's the video had come out for the actual song. Mm-hmm. What I actually thought was, um, you know, between the positive response to last season and the fact that she did comment on his TikTok, like maybe she would mm-hmm. like be kind enough to give us the song that came out of the oven like five seconds ago. Cause mm-hmm. that's a big deal for mm-hmm. a pop star to do. Right. It's that's easier true. to get a song that's been out for a while mm-hmm. and that has already lived its life. But, um, you know, I wrote a letter. This is not a rapid fire, yeah. but I, no, I wrote, I wrote a little straight. personal letter asking for the, Oh wow. Yeah. Wow. Cause, uh, I wanted to explain. I no, are you the first? Responds. Are you the first show that used it? That's used antiheroin. I, I don't know. So. I think so. Someone I think will so. tell us. It was so yeah. quick. It's expensive. Yeah, it so There's quick. no way yeah. that oh, any show cheap. could use it. Yeah. We had yeah. saved money for that, though. Yeah, right. That's smart. There is no such thing as paying too much money for a Taylor Swift song. Agree. As far as I'm concerned. Sarah, what is it like to say farewell to the show as showrunner? I know you're still a producer, but how, so how are you feeling? How are you feeling on the last day, of season four? Um, I feel pretty. Honestly, I feel good about it. I mean, it's been a like actually a life changing experience for me, completely career changing mm. experience. Like nobody could have predicted what this show would become oh, yeah. once it was on Netflix. And like, if you had bumped into me on the street the year before that happened and been like, "So, do you think that you're gonna write like the number one show on Netflix?" I'd be like, "Absolutely not. That's not possible." Mm-hmm. Like, I'm a niche. I write cult hits, mm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like, I write Comic-Con level. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, it's been love. I feel pretty, like, complete with it. The thing about mm-hmm. it is that, um, and also it's easy for me to say because I'm not leaving the show. I'm just turning over the day-to-day. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Greg sent me the book in 2013. Wow. wow. Yeah. I didn't know Ten that. years ago. Wow. Yeah. People We Scared, that was in 2014. We developed it. <laughs> Originally at a whole other place. What? We sold it to Showtime. We developed it there for a year. I didn't know that you went that far in development there. I knew that you yeah. guys had like an almost deal with them, but. Mm-hmm. We had written the script and we parted friends and then we went around and we did like the whole pitch thing, including the stocking again wow. with the script in hand the week Trump was elected. So I remember it really wow. Whoa. clearly like the world was changing very fast that week and we sold it straight to series at Lifetime. That was already, our, you know, so by the time you and I meet, I've been working yeah, on it for that's... years and years. And so to me, it just like in my little corner of the world, it feels like I'm sort of reallocating my bandwidth because mm-hmm. being a day to day showrunner is an incredibly labor intensive job. There's a lot about it that even if you're an absolute master of delegation, you cannot make it take less than 10 hours of your day, <laughs> you know. I just needed to be able to take back some of those hours to do some of the other things that have been on the back burner. I also am really proud to be able to pass the torch. That's how I became a showrunner. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on a show for five seasons. It was Supernatural, right? Yeah. And the creator was moving on to do other development, and he asked me to take over his job, and that he changed my career. Like, you know, being a showrunner is it's like it's kind of a difficult club to get into because they're essentially saying – you know, writer who lives in her bathrobe in a cave and is not particularly great with people. Here's sixty million dollars or a hundred million. You know, mm, wow. like it's a it's a very specific combination of skills, managerial and creative. Yeah, and just to clarify for listeners who you're talking, that's the budget. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you're yeah. not being not handed sixty million. 60 million, million dollars. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, not, so let's, let's, just so people on understand. You, oh no, no, I'm not carrying it around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no it's, it's just like it's you're, you're tasked with managing <laughs> how budget. every yeah. cent of that yeah. is spent, and you mm-hmm. have the entire infrastructure of every studio that's a part of making it. In this case, it's like Warner Brothers and Netflix. Yeah. Who being like, all right, so how are you spending our money? You know, yeah. I mean, yes. that's, it's not literally that direct, but but well, sometimes it probably is. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. I mean, we have line producers. We have producing. There are many. It's a big, it's a big group of people who sure, are doing every, it together. Everybody's the person who stands kind of at the, the where the buck stops. You know, the person who gets the call when someone is furious is me. Yeah. yeah. And um, the and also the person whose name is in New York Times next to yours is me. So like, right. it's with praise comes blame, right? But mm-hmm. I mean, I think the number one thing about being a showrunner is just that somebody who can like withstand a pretty extraordinary amount of stress for a long time, um, and you find that out. Because somebody takes a chance and says, I think that you're suited to this. I think you can handle it. Let me teach you about it. And for me to be able to say, like, oh, and now I've done that Mm. with more showrunners. It just feels really great. 
You know, I can't take a whole lot of credit from Mike and Justin. I mean, they're they were fully formed when they came to us. They were, and they've been with us since. Well, has Justin been with us since, since season one? two? Season yeah. two, and Mike since season one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this is actually, I think, a nice segue into let's get let's get into your let's let's leave you behind because okay. um, you know uh, maybe we've hit our quotient for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you, so you must have been a fantasy fan yes. growing up. Like, because, I mean, you know, you have not mm-hmm. only Supernatural, but you have The Magicians, which is, like, which is, a, um, like, a darkly subversive take on kind of, like, what you also do with our show, which is, like, deconstructing a genre a bit. I mean, among other things, but that's, like, yeah. you're deconstructing the fantasy genre. So were you, like, fantasy lit as a, as a teen growing up? Yeah, I mean, as a small child, even. Right. Mm-hmm. With fairy tales, and my dad was a big Trekkie. So we watched a lot of sci-fi when I was little. And by the time I was 12, I was watching, like, everything in the entire horror section of the video store. I was just really wow. drawn so to... So horror, really? Okay, yeah. okay. I mean, that Which makes is, sense. All of these no. are very closely related, as you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, horror is just the version where you maybe spatter blood at the camera and um, scare people with suspense and stuff. But my brain just, like... I don't know. There's something about that... Now it's almost like Jungian kind of storytelling that's very about what's happening in your shadow yeah, and has those fairy tale archetypes that maybe it's, maybe I just read those books three too many times when I was seven, but everything looks like that to me. And that's kind of how I, you know, filter it through. So yeah, there were, like, I remember reading this series called the dragon riders of Pern when I was. You referenced that. Yes. I remember having to say that. Yeah. That's the only reason because I know it. Because it was great. It was uh, people who ride dragons. Did I say, what did I say that in? I said that in a, a line to somebody. I feel like somebody. maybe Marianne would, and Joe were bonding about it. Yeah, maybe. That's, that's cute. Probably in the show. That's, yeah. really that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, that's but, right. but by the time I was in the age range that you talk about on this show, I had discovered um, historical romance novels. Ah. So I was kind of getting into reading. Actually, what I would do is I would go to the library after school um, with my best friend, and they had the, the, it actually ended up in the set for the Madre Linda Library. They had these like spinning metal yes, carousels. Yes, yes, I was wondering what those were. I mentioned them to the production designer because we had those in our library, and that was the historical hmm. romance paperback section. So, so those were real, the, or were they like created? To represent, to resemble those. They were created to resemble them. Okay, this okay, was okay. obviously, yeah, you know, it's a long time. <laughs> Maybe they're still there, but um, uh, we would like grab an arm load and go and sit in the stacks and we would like skim until we got to the sacks. <laughs> And then we would dog ear the page and pass them <laughs> back and forth. Oh and I, that's God. how, that was the extremely healthy and realistic way I learned about. <laughs> right. About sex. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because, you know, there was no internet porn. Like totally. we only had yeah. the Playboy magazine that somebody stole. Yeah. Out of their dad's nightstand, and then we had, you know, pirates and um, tempestuous virgins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Besides being like a, a lover of fantasy and horror and sci-fi, how would you describe middle school, Sarah? Like, what were you like? Who were you friends with? What were you interested in? Um, I would describe myself as. I mean, I was kind of a lot. <laughs> I was. I was like very. I was not the quietest child (laughs) I would sometimes get in trouble for talking back Mm. like I never got suspended it was never that bad but I would there have I have always had this kind of defiant streak Mm. where if I say something and then the person in the position of authority is like you're wrong and then they move on I'm like but can we go back to that I just Mm. hate it when Mm. it's so I talked back to teachers I got in trouble for that sometimes and I was uh yeah, I mean, I was already an artist by then, I think, or at least yeah, really interested in it. Yeah, I was. I was writing. I was singing. I was dancing. I was. Act- wow. I was oh, that's I, right. Because yeah, yeah you, uh, you, you actually started out as an actress. Well, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say started out. No, but I, I mean, was into yeah. that. I was okay. sort of like mm-hmm. doing. I, I just, I was trying all of it. I, I also took orchestra, so I started playing the flute, and I had a lot of natural aptitude for that. So I ended up like for a while, I thought I was going to be a classical musician. I thought that was going to oh. be my path into college and beyond. So, so seventh grade wow. me. Okay, so you can picture, first of all, picture one eyebrow, complete monobrow, Aww. right? Yeah. This, it was like, I know, it would be, <laughs> and now I'd be like, it's cool, just yeah. leave yeah. it. So, yeah, yeah, you're Actually, just like ahead of the curve. For a second, I yeah. thought you meant 
that you had shaved one eyebrow. One. <laughs> no, Frida. And then I realized you meant, and then, and then I still hadn't remembered that that's not, because, like, we are in at least in some ways a superficially different time, if not a substantially different time. And I was yeah. thinking to myself, like, that sounds cool, but I feel you. That was. No, back in the no, day. No, 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 no. It was cool. like, yeah. It could not at all. Sparse I eyebrows. totally, totally feel yeah. you. Yeah. And then, you know, my mom was like, you're a child. We'll talk about plucking and waxing and shaving when you're a grown woman. Mm. So I was just like, what am I going to do? So I, you know, so I'm on the, the school bus with my headphones and I'm listening to, like, Mozart. No. It was wow. very nerdy, oh, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I had my people who were also kind of strange little smarty pantses. Um, but, yeah, I was like an enthusiastic troublemaker, <laughs> really. What were you like with your parents? Um, I had, as I became more of a teenager, I had a more and more difficult relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So my parents are immigrants, they are um, actually refugees from Poland. Mm -hmm. They met in a refugee camp in Sweden. Wow. Um, so they're basically kind of the generation after the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they were alive because their families fled and then came back after the war. Um, speaking of trauma, yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's a lot in, yeah. in my family lot, story. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. there was an anti-Semitic purge because it's not like people came back after... World War II, and we're like, never mind, we're not going to be anti-Semitic in Europe anymore. Right, yeah. right. And it was still pretty bad. And so in, around 1969, they were just like, you know, all of the Jewish students are free to go now. Mm -hmm. And so they did. My mom was like a freshman in college. And yeah. one, uh, the way they tell it, one day, uh, every Jewish student in the country came home, and their parents had like a suitcase out with a bottle of vodka in it, and they were like, you should go while you can, because wow. communist wow. Poland is not going to be a great place for you. And it wasn't. So... By the time I was 12, 13, you know, my parents had been in this country for a long time. My mom didn't know a word of English when she got here. She was in mm. medical school by this point. Whoa. My dad was working constantly. He was a pathologist, a doctor, and, and a professor at the medical school. So we had one of those, your dad is working, be quiet, houses 100% of the time, right? Yeah. And the more I became my teenage self, really passionate, intense, I've always been an intense person, just the more I would fight with my dad. Mm. And there was just so much. In retrospect, I think he was terrified for me. Mm. I mm. think he saw the world as a profoundly unsafe place for, um, you know, for people like us, just like ethnically and um, religiously, but also just for anyone who sticks their neck out. Mm. Like he didn't, tr you know, he, was, he had these American children, but he didn't fully trust this country he had you know it was a really difficult thing so we would have increasingly just really um just bad fights really bad it was not a great you know i mean i think he was he would have a couple of diagnoses if he was the kind of guy to go do that but he mm. was not from that generation so mm. instead you know we were just in that house no matter what the mood was so did you have siblings yeah one brother one brother are you older or younger um a couple years older okay yeah so you're also the oldest which yeah, firstborn female immigrant kid. Yeah. Yeah. Becomes a showrunner almost yeah, immediately that's... upon setting foot in the television. But that's why it's like, well, <laughs> yeah. she will be very responsible while she's bleeding to death. That's wow. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Sarah, we have, you said you've listened to a few episodes. So yeah. hopefully these questions won't surprise you. But we have a couple of classic questions we like to ask everyone. Okay. So we want to hear about your first crush or love and your first heartbreak or first rejection. Mm hmm. And then we want to hear an embarrassing story. And you do have, a, I think, at least one of those that you'd, you'd mentioned. The crush heartbreak. Yeah, whichever, whichever. Which is also terribly whichever. embarrassing. Yeah. I mean, it didn't go well. <laughs> um, I So I had um, a few friends. We all lived in the same neighborhood. So we were like, we'd take the same bus to school. And um, my best friend lived close to me. And, okay, so let me describe the guy for a second. Yeah, let me yeah, just yeah. Uh, Give right? us all so, this, Tell us the story. His name yeah. is Nate. Nate. This is where the music kicks in that's like kind of romantic, a little bit ominous, like <laughs> kind of like our show. Um, and his thing was like, we would be talking about whatever. First of all, he was the first one to get stubble. You know that feeling when you're mm -hmm. like, look, when do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Being a little girl and being like, so that one's getting stubble. I don't mm -hmm. know why that makes me feel something, but yeah. pheromones are <laughs> happening. And you know, yeah, right. that um, one's a man. For all the other boys, it just yeah. makes them feel um, inferior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ugh. So, you know, Nate, we, we would be talking about, like, you know, a book we had read, a movie we had seen. And no matter what my opinion was, he would just very calmly just take it apart to the studs. Mm. He would tell me why Dang. every single part of it was wrong. Ugh. He wasn't being 
super cruel. I mean, there is something a little bit mean about doing that, but it was good natured. But he was just so smart Mm -hmm. and so cool about it. And I didn't have that many people. Uh, So, you know, it was that thing of of the boy who's like kind of not scared of you, not intimidated. And, you know, when you're kind of like the smart girl, it is, it's a strange, it's sort of a strange position to occupy. Mm. Um, in the ecosystem of the school and um, but he was real smart and real Mm. confident and very laid back and chill about it and oh and also he'd be like what do you mean you haven't seen say anything what do you mean you haven't seen Mm. uh, you know Tom Popo was one if you have if you guys haven't heard of that movie I haven't heard of it Um, is that horror or is that that no 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 it's like a Japanese it's like it's a spaghetti it's a noodle western okay mm-hmm. um it has a famous sexy funny sex scene that mm. is worth mm. everyone seeing it's a classic but um he would show me all these classic I mean, what do you mean you've never seen a david lynch movie so i'd end up like sitting next to this guy like in his tv room and he'd be showing and then like lloyd dobler would be holding the boom bo- or christian slater would be setting the school on fire and it was just like all these things were happening at the same mm-hmm. time and so i you know at a certain point i realized like that feeling is like i'm so in love with Mm -hmm. Um, and he, by the time we were in the ninth grade, he was like, you know, it's school dances. And he was like, I'm thinking to ask someone to the school dance. Mm -hmm. And no part of me was like, maybe he's telling you because, you know, no, no part of me. No, I couldn't conceive of myself that way, really. Mm -hmm. Then I didn't have, I just thought I was sort of a slightly strange girl who was Mm -hmm. a lot. And so I didn't think of myself in like, you're not going to have boyfriends yet Mm -hmm. now you know it's too soon or whatever or maybe never um but that same in that same maybe even the same day my best friend was like do you think Nate is cute I think he's I'm starting to think he's cute so I was like okay I understand my mission yeah let me go back to Nate and tell him that Amber thinks he's cute (gasps) and she should he should invite her to the dance and he did and they hit it off Oh. And they started dating. And I oh, had... This is heartbreaking. Isn't it, it is really heartbreaking, yeah. yeah. I had, like, boxed myself in so perfectly because I could never yeah. tell him, and I also couldn't talk to my best friend about it. So you can't yeah. tell anybody. Yeah. No You're one. just, like, stewing in those feelings that are new as well. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. It was like... Um, and I think we've established, like, my parents were, um, you know, keeping us safe and fed and clothed, but there was no how are you feeling right. or mm-hmm. what's coming up for you. There was... I did not have an adult in my life who could be like, this is normal, what's happening to you right Mm -hmm. now? Or maybe pick another plan besides setting them up. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Does Uh, it feel like maybe that he was, I mean, because the way you were telling it first, I thought you were going to end up with, I thought thought he was going to ask you. I thought maybe that was what was in the cards. Do you Mm -hmm. think that if you had not done that, that it was possibly in the cards for you? Is that too painful of a question? No, 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 no. (laughs) Here's the craziest part of it, ready? So at the end of the ninth grade, I found out we were moving to California. Oh. Um, from where? From we were in Cincinnati. I was lived in Cincinnati mm-hmm. when I was a kid in, in this age. Um, and so, and this too is sort of devastating to move when you're like yeah. 14, yeah, that's 15. Huge. Yeah, huge. Um, like yeah, and leave your friends and leave mm-hmm. everyone. And so the night before we move, right after dinner, there's a knock at the door. It's Nate, and so I go out to chat with him on the porch. He's brought me a farewell gift which is, of course, a mix, mm. right? And then he says, I've made a terrible mistake. Like, you're the, ones that, you're the one I've had feelings for this oh, whole time. No, Sarah. And I was like, but same, though. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. And uh, we sort of like, I don't, I don't the rest is sort of a blur, but then I remember he said, I think I owe you a kiss. <gasps> and oh I know, right? <laughs> so we kissed. I wrote about that in my diary for like the next yeah, year. 30 years. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm actually so impressed by the perfectness oh, of this yeah. story. I so, know. So I know. And I'm not, em- I'm really not embellishing no, this one. I mean, one. it doesn't I'm sound not... like it. It's just like, these are simple facts. Like. Yeah. 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 So we kissed and he left. And then the next morning I got in the car and we drove to California. Wow. <gasps> yeah. I forgot you were moving to California. Yeah. And, no, that's what makes and it's it so not poignant. a time of like texting or cell phones. No, yeah, yeah, this did not exist. Like, you basically yeah. were going to war and never going to see him again. Never did. Have you ever talked to him since? Mm-hmm. You have? Oh, mm-hmm. uh, maybe 12 years ago. So he's wow. not on the socials, which is not a surprise. He's too cool. Yeah. He grew up to be too cool for that. But I had not been in touch with him since we were literally 14, 15 years old. And I was talking to somebody on 
uh, you know, Instagram or something that we went to school. We all went to school and they were like, yeah, Nate is in LA. And I found out he lived a mile away from me. <gasps> and he had actually been living a mile away from me for years. Oh Whoa. And so I reached out and we emailed and we ended up going to that like uh, pub on Main Street in Santa Monica mm-hmm. and having a couple drinks and chatting. And it was very strange because it's not like, yeah. oh, we went to college and then we, yeah, yeah. it was like we were children and now yeah, we're adults. Yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a, uh, there's a, but it yeah. was sort of lovely to Aww. see, you know, who he had turned into and, yeah. Um, I mean, it's so unlikely that he or his, I presume, wife would be listening to this. But um, I will say that, like, a couple of drinks in, I had this moment where I looked at him and I just, like, felt that little surge feeling of attraction. And I was so, I was made so curious by it. I was like, it's been decades Mm -hmm. now. I mean, you know, the scientists are right. I don't know what it is between him and I, mm. but it, I guess it's whatever that is between two people. Sometimes it's there for their whole lives. And yeah. I think that might be why we didn't really become friends. We didn't stay yeah. in touch after that. But Sure, yeah. Yeah. That's, wow. that's also, that's that's also a beautiful that, story. That is a beautiful story, and it's very romantic. Yeah. And I'm just, and I'm just, is, I'm just yeah. appreciating, like, the, because, again, I'm but by me saying that it feels like a perfect story is not to say that it feels embellished. It feels like... I mean, you're a great storyteller, yeah. and yeah. and and I can he- feel the romantic in you. you yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you know the song "The One" by Taylor Swift? Oh yes, I do. I f- do you ever listen to that song? <laughs> I do. I love that album. I love that. that al- like, I love that song. Anyway, just w- as you were telling that story, mm-hmm. I was like, "Roaring Twenties, Tatum and Penny's in the pool." <laughs> just like thinking about that song. Yeah. I mean, it's like I, I don't know. It's incredible. I, I I do feel like because then, I, in my you know 30s, I met the man that I ended up marrying, and I do have this feeling that you you you're ready to really be with someone when you've gone through some of that really hard stuff Definitely. with someone <laughs> like yeah. I mean at least I wish all the luck and love to people who hook up with somebody really early and then stay with them mm-hmm. for their whole lives and you have to do all of it with one person but um I did I feel like I got a lot out of that heartbreak yeah if I can be a complete mercenary writer about <laughs> it yeah yeah no, it's valuable stuff that you learn. Yeah, absolutely. Our other yeah. our other classic question is an embarrassing story from your youth. Any wasn't this one? I mean, all of them are embarrassing. <laughs> this was embarrassing, embarrassing at all. I actually feel this like this was elegant. Poignant. Yeah, I actually yeah. feel like <laughs> it was really. Um, is I feel like it was, it's definitely one of the best told we have. I think it's just, so. Just, I was there. Yeah. 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 And that on the porch, like, man, it was a, it was on the porch. That's a good scene. We lived on Grace Avenue. Oh, mm. perfect. Uh, and the you were intersection grace. was Utopia. I mean, no. I don't know what they were doing in this. Yeah. <laughs> were you in a lot? <laughs> you were in a back lot. You lived in the Truman Show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have an embarrassing story? You don't have to have one, but. I mean, I have a human. I mean, it was, I think it goes beyond embarrassing. I felt embarrassed at the time. This, I doubt this one will be as well told, so you can take it or leave it. But um, I, uh, I did uh, really bring something out sometime in certain adults when I was 12, 13 years old. And I've thought a lot about it. It's like, I'm, I'm really glad you invited me to come talk to you because I haven't considered that time of life much mm. for a really long mm. time. But now I look back and it just seems so clear to me that when you have a child who has ability in some area, like nowadays, or ideally at any point in history, like the adults, their job is to challenge them and keep that kind of safe and then also give context for that. Like, doesn't make you the king of the world, but it also, you know, it's like everybody has their own thing. This is your, I feel like, because I was a smart kid, I was skipped up a year, which is something I don't think they They do much anymore. anymore. um, Because you cannot skip up emotionally. You just cannot. Yeah, Yeah. it's true. But I showed up to kindergarten reading and writing and doing math and stuff. So they were just like, do you want, you know, they they put me through a lot of tests. They skipped me up. And then it was not difficult for me to catch up Mm -hmm. academically. And I think seeing this girl who had also been raised by, you know, one thing that my dad was really adamant about was like, you know, her, his mother had all this unrealized potential because she spent her life serving his father. Mm. And she was brilliant and it made him really sad. And don't rely on a man. Like, don't wow, consider cool. yourself different. And so I was raised no different from my brother, intellectually, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, was often in these academically gifted classes where everybody was a little obnoxious, right? So I get to this bigger public school 
And I'm just acting. I'm thinking I should cue off whoever the smartest kids in the class are. I'm not thinking about gender. Mm -hmm. But I think it really pushed people's buttons that this girl was acting so confident and smart and occasionally interrupting. Like, not even, you know, but they're not thinking it was worse from the guy. They're just thinking mm -hmm. this. And I feel like the, the adults around me, they were worried that I would get a big head. Mm -hmm. And they were worried that I would make other people feel bad. So the messaging that I got was all about tampering it down, mm. not talking about it. Don't think you're smart. Mm. Like, just, in fact, I didn't. At a certain point, I was like, it took, I was in therapy, and we were talking. So there was a day where I interrupted my history teacher, and it was towards the end of class, and he was like, he, in front of the whole class, he, he told me why that was wrong. And then he said the words, I have never seen a smart girl act like that. <gasps> I felt everyone around me, like, shrivel into the earth because mm -hmm. they were like, oh, God, this is going to happen. We're all sitting here. And I just sat there like this. And he, I mean, in my mind, it was 45 minutes, so it must have mm. been, like, five. Mm -hmm. And he just went off about my oh. behavior, oh. which had never been, maybe I was, a, I was probably moderately obnoxious, but I no, was but never to the point of, and I just had triggered him mm -hmm. so much. And that, too, was a thing where I left, and it's like I never even told my parents mm -hmm. because my job was to fit in and do well and not get in trouble. And I didn't know what to do but to go back to class the next day and just shut the fuck up, really. So, see, that goes beyond. See, that was serious. Everybody's no, face looks very serious no, now. No, no, but, no, yeah. No, no, no we, yeah. I, we, have, we have plenty of very yeah. Yeah. intense yeah. conversations. Yeah. So well, you know what's that. really interesting, Sarah? We just, before you came, we interviewed Eliza Schlesinger and mm. we asked her, because she has a book where she talks about sort of societal expectations that are placed on women. Mm -hmm. And we asked her, what do you think is one of the most like absurd expectations we place on women? And she described exactly yeah, what you're the saying, phenomenon that is like what happened to you, where we don't want girls to be confident. No. We, we want them to be humble, and but not in a way that we expect men to be. It's just so interesting that that's what she said, and you're telling a story yeah. that, like, is the exact example of what she was describing. It makes me so sad mm -hmm. for, well, for so many, just any kid who's considered anything but the person that that's appropriate for, which is a mm -hmm. very small minority of children. Like, no girls are in that group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope, I mean, I hope things have gotten better. Like, when I, I'm very lucky to have a beautiful and very brilliant goddaughter, and I really went out of my way to tell her how cool it was, just the stuff that she's good at, mm -hmm. that we should do more of it. Like being curious is a superpower. Mm -hmm. And um, I still, I feel like I will probably go to my grave with this essential tension between like who I would have been if I just was this um, effusive, intense, curious, smart girl, and then being told to like keep it down, mm -hmm. not make someone else feel bad, be more of a girl about it. Mm -hmm. And um I think the tension between those two things will never fully go away. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. But I, I think, you know, I think the point of generations is that, like, what you, having learned from that tension, the point of life isn't to get rid of it for yourself, but to mm -hmm. hopefully, like, yeah, d d d give it a little bit better to your goddaughter. All mm -hmm. the, all the yeah. young mm -hmm. people you come into contact with throughout your life, then, it's just, like, it's about hoping you mm -hmm. can lessen that, you know, that, I think so. that create more less tension you know I, th I really love that we have our final question which is on a sweet light note yeah if you could go back to 12 or 13 year old Sarah what would you say or do has anything about my description of her made you think that she would listen to me <laughs> well that's actually you know, you know what I, like, now, you? now having asked this question mm. to so many people uh -huh. what my answer is now like I yeah. would there's no yeah like would he listen Mm -hmm. Is really actually the, is like what 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 would it take for them to listen as kind of another way to think about it? But regardless, like yeah. if she could hear you, I f I would I would tell her that that um who she is is a package deal, mm -hmm. and that her job moving forward is not actually to make all of the good parts more, and like scoop all of the bad parts out with like. A, mm grapefruit spoon you know um it took me until like it took a lot of therapy actually for me to realize that I thought all of the difficult and problematic and itchy and weird parts of me like I thought I was going to be like eradicating them completely mm -hmm. you know 
Um, and now I realize it's like, no, you're going to you're going to get conscious about all of it and you're going to befriend who you actually are. Um, and the sooner you can do that, the sooner it doesn't matter so much what the other people say, you know. So, I mean, I can't even imagine how powerful I'd be if I had started mm. being friendly to myself when mm. I was 12, 13 years old. Can you imagine? Yeah. Like a lot of stuff gets held back, I think, just because teenagers are yeah. busy hating themselves. They're the most powerful force on the earth. Right. <laughs> I love that. I really like yeah. that you yeah. say that. I really, really like that. Sweet. I think it's so true, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So nice, this is great. Yeah, this yeah. is lovely. You can watch Sarah Gamble's show, You, on Netflix, or you can follow her online at Sarah Gamble. Sarah with an E. Okay, wait, I have a rapid fire question oh, just now. Um, wait, I've forgotten it. Okay, Kay. I'll do mine and then, and then we'll come back to you. Um, and we'll